Okay, welcome everyone to this fourth uh, seminar in the Climate Perspective Seminar Series. My name is Camilla, I'm an undergraduate here at SOAS, and I've been convening this seminar series with a great group of people. And I'm Ellie, and I'm a postgraduate here at SOAS. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the objective with the Climate Perspective Seminar Series is to approach uh, climate change from dif different perspectives thereby trying to um, better understand the ways in which climate change relates to our own and other societies. Three weeks ago, in our Climate Change and Politics seminar, Larry Lohman, climate re researcher at the Corner House, discussed the ways in which the politics of climate change have been framed in ways that largely accommodate to Western points of view, but neglect uh, the ways in which climate issues relate to the livelihoods of, uh, local, of communities in other parts of the world in many, uh, in many cases. Two weeks ago, in our Climate Change and Development Seminar, uh, Dr. Andrew Newsham, uh, SOAS, discussed climate change in relation to globalization and how it's becoming increasingly crucial to address uh, the inequality between those responsible for climate change and those most affected by it. And last week, in our Climate Change and Law Seminar, uh, Dr. Feja Lesniowska illustrated how classical ideas about the purpose of law um, are being challenged by the uncertainty and instability as a, uh, uh, emerging in our societies as a result of climate change. So tonight the seminar will focus on climate change and economics. Uh, we will attempt to understand which changes are needed and which decisions must be made in our economies to effectively reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So the talk will last approximately 45 minutes, followed by a question and answer se uh, section discussion. Uh, if you want to tweet about it, then you can use the hashtag Climate Perspectives. Um, so I would now like to warmly introduce our speaker, Dr. Harold Hoibom. Harold is a lecturer and assistant professor in uh, Global Energy and Climate Policy at the Centre for International Studies and Diplomacy, CISD, here at SOAS. Uh, his research focuses on organisational change and innovation in global energy and climate governance, energy and climate policy in the Asia, Pacific and Europe, low carbon cities and urban resource management and also low carbon finance. He convenes CISD's Masters in Global Energy and Climate Policy, to which I have the pleasure of being a student this year. So without further ado, please welcome Harold. All right. Um, well, thank you very much, Ellie and uh, Camilla, for organising, and thank you all for coming. I uh, should say at the start, I have this tendency to pace up and down the room a little bit, but I've been told that that's not good because of the microphone, so I'll try and, and stand here as best, as best I can. If I ever veer off over there, you'll, you'll tell me to, uh, to come back. And also, I should say, I've not really timed this, uh, this presentation. I've got the clock there, but the thing is that uh, uh, at the CISD, uh, we tend to have, what well, we do have, lecture slots of two hours. Um, so breaking it all down to 45 minutes is uh, a challenge for me, um, but hopefully uh, we'll be fine. It might actually be a little less, see how we go. Um, so climate change and economics. Um, the last disclaimer, before I start, right, welcome, uh, before, I, uh, before I start, is that even though it is titled climate change and economics, really cannot not talk about the politics of the process, because those are really two indivisible things. Is climate change really simply or primarily an economic issue, as a lot of economists would have you uh, believe, or is it uh, quite a bit more than that? Do we need to understand political dimensions in order to then be able to comprehend um, the economic implications and what would need to happen economically? to set us up for a better future. I'll come back to this uh, uh, in, a, in a bit. But I wanted to give you at the start, why might we go about thinking that this is an economic issue, is a, an excerpt from um, the Bird hegel Resolution, which was a resolution passed by the United States Senate in the summer of 1997 before negotiations to the Kyoto Protocol went underway in Kyoto, so the Kyoto Protocol being the first treaty we had in the global climate system to help us reduce CO2 emissions, 
stabilize them in the atmosphere and do something about climate change. We all know that Kyoto wasn't particularly successful. The United States Senate preempted these negotiations knowing what was about to come, because the process had been going on for a number of years already since the uh, Rio Earth Summit and the uh, foundation of the United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change. And they framed their argument against uh, the Kyoto Protocol and against commitments internationally to do something about climate change uh, on mainly economic grounds. That it would be a problem for the United States economy. So the United States should not be a signatory to any protocol or other agreement because it would result in serious harm to the economy of the United States and not just looking at the US economy in an isolated way but also it against developing country parties, primarily China and India, which were of course uh, projected to uh, grow significantly economically in the years uh, ahead, and, uh, and uh, were strategic competitors to the United States uh, economically. So would result in serious harm to the economy of the United States, and any agreement that the US would wish to be part of should make very clear where the financial costs are and where the impacts on the United States economy would be. Right? The Clinton administration did not send the Kyoto Protocol to the United States Senate for ratification because the Bert Hegel resolution had passed 95 to 0. There was absolutely no appetite in the Senate, which needs to be consulted if an international treaty is to be effective within the US context. It has to sign off on it didn't happen. President Clinton belatedly signed uh, the Kyoto Protocol, but in 2001, the Bush administration used that same argument, the George W. Bush administration, to withdraw President Clinton's signature under the Kyoto Protocol. Now, that isn't anything that had any effect as such, because the United States, not having ratified, wasn't party to the Kyoto Protocol, but it was a symbolic act to show that the United States really didn't have an appetite for it based on the potential serious economic harm and uh, competitive um, uh, um, uh, disadvantage that it would put itself in if it were to sign the Kyoto Protocol. Um, and it is a, a similar argument that, uh, that the uh, Trump administration is using now, only much more extreme. It's not just the economic argument. Of course, the Trump administration is also questioning leading members of the administration openly questioning the science underpinning a climate change. So, <clears throat> the first few thoughts on why we might think that it is an economic disadvantage, that it pits uh, uh, us against economic growth and development and would be harmful to economies such as uh, the United States economy. The first that I thought of thinking about these, and a lot more than the three that I've put up here, we can discuss those uh, later on, is that historically speaking, there's been a high upfront cost for renewable energy sources. So the very sources we would need to transition away from a high emissions carbon intensive pathway to a low carbon, low emissions pathway are very costly at the start. The capital costs of renewables are in the hundreds of millions or billions, depending on the size of the project. And historically, of course, these costs were even higher than they are now. They've come down a lot. But the difference to fossil fuels is that coal-fired power stations or gas-fired power plants are a lot cheaper to build. The cost arising from these power plants is in having to consistently buy in the resource, the coal, the gas, maybe the oil if you use that for power generation. Right? So fluctuations in that price are going to harm you potentially in the long run. But you don't have to mobilize the kind of amounts of money that are required for renewables, and that can be difficult if the banks aren't giving it, if the international financial markets aren't giving it, if you don't have the political support for it. So that would have been one of the arguments. The second is on the path dependency of the system. What do I mean by that? We have a system that's built or been built up since the Industrial Revolution based on an economic system, based on the widespread use of fossil fuels. The production and consumption of energy 
from fossil sources, coal, gas, and oil. A system that's been in place, when you think about oil, for well more than 100 years, when you think about coal, for pretty much 200 years, and gas, well, a little less than oil, sort of the second half of the 20th century, gas expands a lot in use uh, around the world, as we're able to access uh, gas plays and uh, use it in an economically sensible, sensible way. So a system has grown, an infrastructure has grown, power plants, transmission grids, uh, gas storage, uh, mining, coal and uh, uh, um, drilling for oil and gas, that, uh, that is in place, that supplies us with the energy we need. We could today run all the things that we need, produce all the goods and the services that we need on fossil fuels. If it wasn't for climate change, we wouldn't need, or some other issues such as ambient air pollution, water pollution, etc., we wouldn't need to shift away from fossil fuels at all. A lot of money has gone into this system, a lot of costs have been sunk into it, and a lot of interests have built up around it. So, of course, there are industries, there are companies, there are powerful players that exist and thrive and prosper in this system. Whenever you build up a business, a company, and you supply someone with a good or a service that is in high demand, you, of course, have an interest in preserving that relationship and keeping that going, and in, if at all possible, expanding it and getting more return for your investment. So what we have on top of the infrastructure that's in place is relationships that have built up between governments, regulators, supposedly independent regulatory bodies, and the industry. Because they've shared information and knowledge over time, because they've gotten to know each other very well, because the government and the regulators know about uh, the money that these companies put in to build out the system, the taxation they get from them, the employment they provide, all of that builds pretty durable relationships. In the extreme case, we call them iron triangles. We also call them policy monopolies. On the basis of those shared interests, of course the government and the regulators are interested in those companies providing sufficient amounts of energy uh, at all times and at affordable prices. That's energy security for you. You need to be energy secure if you want to have an economy that prospers and thrives and grows. If the lights keep going out, if you don't have enough energy to pursue the kind of businesses that you want to pursue, uh, you're not going to be having a growing and thriving economy. So there's an interest there, of course, that is served from a public perspective. But on top of that, I've built a number of arrangements uh, uh, such as subsidy schemes, subsidization of fossil fuels, both on the production side and on the consumption side. So very cozy, very close arrangements that on the one hand make sense because fossil fuels have provided us with a lot of prosperity and a lot of opportunities. The fact that we get to sit here, that we get to have heating in winter, right? All our heating is supplied by gas primarily. All our transportation needs, flying and cars and trucks and whatnot, is uh, 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 supplied with uh, petrol, oil-based transportation fuels. And most of our electricity in this country, fortunately, is changing, is supplied by the use of coal, certainly in many countries uh, around the world. Right? So it's given us a lot of good <laughs> since the Industrial Revolution, um, a period of 200 years or so. But it's also had negative consequences. But right now, the system is, pa is path dependent. It is sort of staying on this trajectory, and it's very hard to shift these alliances that have built over a long period of time. And the third, and that issue is related to this second, is the lobbying against climate change efforts by precisely the people that are at the core of the system that has built up since the Industrial Revolution. And that lobbying is not just to do in the way that I've just explained, which is building up these relationships with policymakers and regulatory agencies over time. It is, of course, also trying to convince the public of the value of fossil fuels and to convince them or to at least spread doubt concerning the value and the viability of renewable alternatives.
or spread doubt as to the case, the very strong scientific case, for climate change mitigation and adaptation. Of course, the best example here is ExxonMobil. And for those of you who followed this debate in 2015, Inside Climate News and the LA Times uh, pursued uh, some very effective investigative reporting and found that ExxonMobil had deliberately misled the public, policymakers, interested parties on the state of climate science for over 30 years. But ExxonMobil knew already in the late 1970s and early 1980s that climate change was real, it was anthropogenic, that is, it was man-made. It would have serious consequences. That ExxonMobil actually used internally that information to find out that there would be better access around the North Pole for drilling for oil and gas. So far, they agreed that climate change was an important thing for them because it would free up new plays. But they would say in public, they would say with policymakers and key gatekeepers, they would say with gatekeepers being the ones that have influence in a particular issue area, they would say with stakeholders that it wasn't a clear cut case at all, that we weren't sure that climate change was happening first, then that it was anthropogenic, and then what the consequences might be. So a very deliberate misinformation campaign funding think tanks, funding uh, researchers, scientists, funding uh, to, to news agencies as well that would put out stories, that would put out reports to try and undermine the scientific consensus that ExxonMobil already assumed to be existing, to be in existence in the early 1980s. And others would have done the same. And this is not just about climate change, this is also to do with the case against renewables, which are the necessary alternative to the system that currently exists, the low carbon alternative, renewables, energy efficiency, etc. So all the information you would have seen uh, on how expensive, prohibitively expensive they are, they're way too intermittent. We can't make a system work that's built on renewables. It doesn't make any economic sense, it doesn't make any logistical sense, we shouldn't even go there, way too difficult is in part true, because historically, high upfront cost of renewables, and yes, renewables are intermittent, if you exist in a very small area where you can only draw on one energy source, be it solar, for example, you'll only have that during the day. If you don't have storage and backup, you won't have any electricity at night. Or if you only have wind power, well, the wind doesn't always blow. But we know very well that in integrated systems, large integrated systems, such as the European Union or a country such as the UK, you can pursue different renewable energy sources and you can balance the demands and supply uh, um, a provision over the course of the day, course of weeks, months, years. And with the growth of storage technology, we're going to be able to back that up. Now, that is a process. I accept that this hasn't always been in existence and there needs to be more happening in order to make that a reality. But of course it is possible. But you've got to understand, of course, and many of you will understand, and know that already, that any industry, in whatever line of work you might be in, whatever business you might be pursuing, is of course interested in maintaining market share, ideally growing that, maintaining a privileged position if at all possible, continuing to receive governmental support, you'd be mad if you didn't do that. So you can understand why oil and gas companies and coal companies would pursue a strategy that seeks to undermine that which is a main threat to their very existence. So any business and any industry would do it, just in this particular case, climate change uh, is so uh, challenging for us and threatening that uh, uh, we have to do something to address these issues um, more effectively. So, why we might think that, and now what has changed since? Dramatic cost declines for renewables. The economics of renewables, which is something you need to talk about when you talk about the economics of climate change, have changed dramatically over the last 20, 30 years. The price of a solar panel has collapsed Dramatically. In part, this is, large part, this is because governments created a demand for it. One of the leading examples being Germany, which put in place Sweden tariff schemes, 
to financially incentivize the uptake of renewable energy sources, in this case solar, primarily solar, also wind to some extent. That is, you pay people a premium on the electricity or independent power providers on the electricity they generate from renewable sources. You force utility companies to buy up all the electricity they generate to put it into the system. We are forcing the door open to try and create a level playing field which these new entrants that are in a disadvantaged position are trying to gain access. That has led to cost declines. Why? Because as we build out capacity, as we produce more and more solar panels, as more and more places around the world install these solar panels, we learn the maturity of, those, uh, uh, of that technology increases and the cost can decline, economies of scale, effectively. Another major push uh, in the late 2000, what, 2006 to 2009, 10 the mass production of solar panels in China, in part to satisfy the demand coming from the German market, but also from other markets around the world, places that put in place progressive policies to incentivize the uptake of that technology. Of course, there is a demand that's being created that needs to be satisfied. They produced it en masse. It led to a dramatic collapse of prices, which of course is leading to grid parity for solar uh, in many places around the world already today. Wind, a very similar developments. Onshore wind in many places in the UK, uh, pretty much grid parity. In others, it's outperforming uh, fossil fuel alternatives because of the wind conditions. So dramatic cost declines since those days. Visible impacts of climate change. So we're not just talking about the economics of climate change in some kind of an abstract sense, what it might cost our economies as and when the impacts of climate change hit, because in many places they're already here today. Bolivia is a great example, where the glaciers have been receding for more than 40% since 1985. Bolivia is facing a drought now. It has been in that situation for a number of years. The lakes run dry, the reservoirs are running dry. They don't have enough water for agricultural production. Uh, we have other impacts around the world already. I mean, scientists just I read today or yesterday declared large parts of the Great Barrier Reef dead. It's not dead because it's bleached to death. That happens as a consequence of the warming of the oceans. Of course, we have a rise in global average surface temperature as a consequence of uh, the greenhouse effect of climate change, and also an increasing acidification of the oceans. As you introduce more CO2 into the ocean, oceans are sinks, just like forests are sinks, they take in and store CO2, the water acidifies. That then kills off uh, coral reefs. Of course, those coral reefs are important because they're the nurseries of much of the global fish stock, not just the Great Barrier Reef, other reefs too. So there are direct impacts already today. Those are just two. There are many others in China, for example, but I'm just giving you those. Third is the unburnable carbon issue. Now, a few years ago, I was um, part of a scenario exercise run by a major energy company. I can't disclose the name of um, there were primarily economists in the room who talked about, you know, how renewables were or weren't credible alternatives to fossil fuels, how we could map out a future that is climate changed, how we could transition the energy system in a cost-effective way. One of the arguments raised uh, was that of uh, unburnable carbon, the carbon bubble. So what we have as part of the Paris Agreement is an understanding that there is a global carbon budget. That means we can only burn that much more, we can only burn that many more fossil fuels as fossil fuel combustion releases CO2 in order to stay within the two degree stabilization pathway. So the goal of international agreements and international uh, uh, climate change diplomacy is that we can stay within two, degree, two degrees, a two degree rise above 
pre-industrial levels. Two degree rise in global average surface temperatures above pre-industrial levels. Since the Industrial Revolution, global average surface temperatures have already gone up by one degree. So we haven't got a lot more time because what we continue to do every day is we continue to carbon load the atmosphere. All the emissions that we generate from combusting coal and oil and gas are going into the atmosphere. Some of it sinks and stored in forests and oceans, but a lot of it's stored in the atmosphere. And CO2 remains there for 100 years, slightly more than 100 years. So the long-term implications of that are already factored into the system. So we can only burn that much more, and then we've reached a point where two degrees are not possible anymore. But we'll shoot beyond that, to three degrees, four degrees, and potentially more. And the unburnable carbon argument basically says that if you're serious about that, and that you can't burn all the fossil fuels still out there, you have to leave most of the coal, pretty much all of the coal, but most of the oil and gas currently still in the ground, right there. You'll have to leave it in the ground. You can't bring it out, you can't burn it. Because if you do, we'll overshoot our targets. And it'll be game over for the two degrees. Now you can argue that given the current trajectory we're on and what individual countries have submitted as their plans under the Paris Agreement, their intended nationally determined contributions is definitely not enough. Given that, we'll probably end up at three and a half or four degrees. We have to be a lot more ambitious than that. But certainly part of it has to be this argument. And so in that debate, the economists all laughed and they said, oh, no, this is not an issue. This is not something we concern ourselves with. It's not something that any serious company or any serious economist is giving any credence. Three, four years later, I read articles written by these same economists saying how important the unburnable carbon argument was to the debate and how it highlighted the economic implications of, uh, of a continued, more than that, political implications, health implications, environmental implications of a continued reliance on fossil fuels. So within a short space of just a few years, this issue has become really rather important in the debate. And it has led, of course, to the divestment movement, that some of you may be uh, aware of, to divest aw away from uh, uh, fossil fuel your assets, and whether or not you believe that that movement can actually achieve significant uh, uh, outcomes, it certainly has installed that issue in the debate. So a negative change for fossil fuels, a positive change for renewables, and at the same time impacts of climate change becoming much more visible around the world. One last thing I'll say on this, ever since the last IPCC uh, assessment report has been published, the trajectory that we're on and what we've seen happening over the last few years has been significantly worse than what that report predicted. The emissions being generated, the temperature changes have all played out in a significantly more dramatic way than projected because uh, the IPCC reports are uh, compromise. Uh, they're a compromise amongst uh, not just scientists but the governments too that have to uh, sign off on it. It's called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change after all. So that's been changed there. So you can say overall, overall, this is not just economics, this has got to be politics too. Because it is governments that have provided the framework for this to happen. Second, the economic implications of climate change. I'll speed this up a little bit. I wanted to give you a quick quote from the Stern Review on points of climate change. So the Stern Review, commissioned by the Treasury, the UK government, uh, comes out in 2006. It's the first major contribution in the climate change debate that has international impact that is entirely of an economic nature. Former chief economist, the World Bank, uh, Nicholas Stern, and his uh, associates write this report, a report that's been criticized on the methods it's used, on the discounting rate it's used, etc. But the report's general findings and general arguments are not disputed widely in the field at all. And those are, 
There are uncertainties as to the impacts of climate change, but we know enough about the risks in order to take early action. Why? Because early action will outweigh later costs. If we wait until later in the century to tackle climate change, because we might argue that uh, our economies will continue to grow, will generate a lot more uh, uh, prosperity, will have a lot more money available at that point in time, um, and as a consequence, a lot more willingness perhaps to tackle the difficult issues, the costly issues. Uh, if we wait until this point, the impacts of climate change based on best available science, and the Stern Review has been updated since, and they update it every year at the Grantham Institute, uh, the LSE, and elsewhere, um, would significantly, still significantly outweigh uh, that which we can mobilize at that point in time, because the costs would just be so astronomical, um, the impacts of climate change. So ignoring it, will damage economic growth, and tackling climate change would be the pro-growth strategy for the longer term. The costs today, if you factor it into the system, are relatively low. If you wait longer, there's a lot more to do, it's a lot more expensive. Of course, this was 2006, that's more than 10 years ago. Since then, a lot has happened, and we haven't really made that much progress. So already, the price tag that comes with significant action on climate change has gone up. One example from China. Um, this is not on climate change. With the impact of air pollution and water pollution on the Chinese GDP. The Rand Corporation in a report published in 2015, estimates that the losses to Chinese GDP from air and water pollution amount to 6.5%. So a lot of these assessments are based on the additional healthcare costs, what people suffer as a consequence of airborne pollution. Think of Beijing, think of Shanghai, some of these places, smog, uh, the the health issues as a consequence of that, the environmental issues, uh, impacts for agriculture, etc. The World Bank, the same assessment, 2007 though, 5.8% of GDP lost. Now, the 3% is interesting because that's the Chinese Ministry of the Environment. So, of course, they wouldn't be quite as aggressive in the numbers they put out, because once you assign a very high value to the loss or the cost that you incur as a consequence of climate change, you're going to be, have to be committed to acting upon it, to doing something about it. The pressures to then act would be significantly higher than if you say, well, it's a couple of percentage points, but even 3% is significant, thinking of the GDP of the People's Republic. Now, 13.5% what the Chinese Academy of Sciences has recently established is the loss to the Chinese GDP. Now they're looking not just at um, water pollution, they're looking at a wider picture of uh, overuse of resources, soil pollution. It's a much bigger picture, but 13.5% in a country that is intent on continuing to provide relatively high stable growth rates over a longer period of time and needs to do that to uh, keep the peace internally, if you will, economically speaking, socially speaking. This is something you cannot really ignore. You'll want to act on that. And this is about localized issues first and foremost. So particular matter, PM2.5, it's about acid rain, as a consequence of sulfur dioxide, mercury poisoning. A lot of the issues that occur when you burn large amounts of coal or when you combust large amounts of oil um, through the internal combustion engines in cars and trucks. Yeah. So that's created in that way. But climate change can have very similar uh, impacts and can exacerbate some of these. I don't have the numbers for you here, but just today, for a different class I was, I was teaching, I, uh, we looked at the small island states, Pacific island states. And the impact on these small island states
natural disasters. They are the most at risk for GDP losses from these natural disasters, cyclones, typhoons. Earthquakes, of course, as well. We don't associate those with climate change, but the others we do because we know that we're going to see a lot more of these and we're going to see more dramatic effects. They're going to be much more intense flooding events, uh, storm, storm events, etc. And for a country like Vanuatu, I believe it was, uh, the cost, the loss of GDP annually from these events is 7%. Almost 7%. So, exacerbated by the impacts of climate change, think what that does to countries uh, around the world. Is it too costly to transition the entire energy system? No, in one word, one uh, word answer, but the costs we're going to incur and face to transition to renewable sources, to invest in storage, to invest in new infrastructure for electromobility, etc., are very high. They're in the trillions, of course. But every year, we spend hundreds, not just hundreds of billions, but trillions already on renewing existing infrastructure, on building new energy infrastructure, coal-fired power generation, gas-fired power generation, yes, also some oil-fired power generation, nuclear power plants, giving away money in subsidies. So the question is, do you want to transition and spend money on transitioning into a low-carbon future with renewables or not? If you don't, you will still have to put in an awful lot of money to A, replace aging infrastructure. Think that the lifespan of a coal-fired power plant or gas-fired power station the older ones, maybe 30 years, 40 years, say 40 years. But at some point, you need to renew that infrastructure. You still need to build out your grids. You still, still need to build high-voltage transmission lines, regardless, because you want to reduce line loss and you have a lot more electricity transport, regardless of whether you go renewable or not. The money is huge. You can make the choice to go renewable in any case. So it is not prohibitive, prohibitively expensive just to go renewable, it's going to cost you an awful lot of money in any case. And I think all of us would agree that nuclear, for example, is a very expensive technology indeed that takes up a lot more money uh, in subsidies, government support, than renewables do for each individual plant. Now, they produce a lot of electricity too, admittedly, but, uh, but uh, you can't hold it just against low-carbon or no-carbon sources such as renewables. Now, what does the Paris Agreement mean from an economic perspective? I would put it to you that given that the global economy is so entirely reliant on energy, energy which is primarily generated from fossil fuel sources, again, without that, we wouldn't have the economy we have today, we wouldn't have the globalized world we have today, we wouldn't be able to transport goods and services around the world we do, we wouldn't have had the growth and prosperity that we've benefited from. Okay, so fossil fuels have been very important. Um, energy is very important. Without energy security, the supply of sufficient amounts at affordable prices over time, you can't have that growth. Given this, and given that the Paris Agreement and addressing climate change effectively means having to shift your energy system from fossil fuels to renewables, and having to shift it in many cases, not just from one source to the other, but also shifting it from centralized fossil fuel power generation to much more distributed options on the renewable side. The Paris Agreement, as a consequence, is the world's most important economic treaty. You don't tend to think about the Paris Agreement as an economic treaty or as the most important energy treaty that's ever existed. We tend to think about it as an environmental treaty that's over there somewhere. But the implications of Paris for every country in the international system are such, from an economic perspective, that they have the most far-reaching consequences, much more important than uh, individual trade agreements around the world and trade blocks that we already have in the European Union, NAFTA, and all these other agreements. The implications of this are serious. And when you look at the INDCs and the 
plans that countries have put forward to make a change and make a difference, they all refer to the changes they're going to make in the energy system, how they're going to do more on the renewable side, some CCS, carbon capture and storage, some nuclear. But of course, all of them refer to the importance of their economies, shielding their economies, protecting their economies, making their economies competitive uh, for the future. So the implications are economic of this Paris Agreement and political. Our Paris could fail precisely on the economic front. One, INDCs are voluntary. So the one thing that made Paris possible that uh, we didn't set targets for individual countries. But the international community said, we'll all submit what we think we can do, individual countries, to together achieve this common goal of reducing CO2 emissions to the point where we can achieve the two degree target. Or ideally, the ambition being 1.5 degrees. But that's not really written in, it's just an ambition. It's voluntary. So of course, the Obama administration submitted a very ambitious INDC. I have no doubt the Trump administration will take that away. And they will submit something if they stay within Paris, which is possible and likely, they will submit something that is meaningless. You don't have to show ambition in your INDC. There is no force that compels you to do so. Such is the state of international relations, the international system. We don't have a controlling legal or executive authority that can enforce that at this point in time. Certainly not when the biggest economy or one of the biggest economies is the one not playing ball. So Trump doesn't have to leave Paris at all. It can just submit an INDC that is not ambitious and that doesn't really meet the requirements of this climate trajectory. So under the argument that he needs to protect the US economy. And you see in a lot of the INDCs that have been submitted from Indonesia, from China, from elsewhere, the preamble is always, we need to make sure that our economic development needs and our poverty eradication needs come first. And once we've addressed that, we can then do all the other stuff. So a lot of what we propose is conditional on first addressing this and getting finance from the international community. And then we can do these things. So it is in that context. It could fail in that context. Um, second, what I just referred to, the importance of economic growth and development. And that sort of ties it back to Larry Lohman's talk on the North-South dynamic and the different understandings of what you may wish to pursue in your systems. Now, the UNFCCC does not have the power, does not have the right to tell its parties, the parties to the Paris Agreement, what energy mix to pursue, what economic tools and levers to put in place. This is up to the sovereign decision of countries in the international system. And of course, there's pressures on them coming from all sides, multilateral development banks, countries in the global north, etc. But this is always going to be an issue, especially under this common but differentiated responsibilities approach taken under Kyoto and Paris and respective capabilities. And the lack of financial support for developing countries to be able to put in place the measures that they would need to put in place in transition to uh, a low carbon future. Now, a number of reasons for why uh, 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 Newly industrializing countries, developing countries aren't really, in many ways, in many cases, not keen on renewables. There are problems around understanding what renewables are for and the value of them and how, how they can be put in place and what they can do and contribute. In countries like Malaysia and elsewhere, there are misunderstandings around that. There is a, an abundance of cheap coal. In Southeast Asia, which I would argue is the next big thing, China has decided to level off its CO2 emissions at some point, peak them. Indonesia, uh, other countries in Southeast Asia haven't done the same thing. They've said they'll reduce the energy intensity of their production to some extent compared to a baseline scenario. But they're not going to peak it. And most of these countries in Southeast Asia are looking at coal 
already a process that's underway. So a lot of new coal-fired power plants are being built in that part of the world um, and elsewhere in sub-Saharan Africa too. So unless there is financial support to transition away from that, unless there's support for capacity building, know-how, technology transfer, it's going to be tricky. Of course, there are sums of money being transferred already today because we are building uh, wind farms and solar farms in China and elsewhere. We are investing in energy efficiency. We are doing all these good things, but at the same time, we're also still investing in the traditional ways of doing things, which is fossil fuel based. So this happens at the same time. So, addressing climate change is a political choice because you can choose to produce a policy framework and an environment within which renewables are allowed to thrive. You can provide financial incentives for that. And you can provide policies that very directly try to push fossil fuel infrastructure out of the system. So we have market-based mechanisms, emissions trading. I'm not going to talk about that very much now. We could do that in the Q&A, perhaps. But all the while we have that, we also have other approaches in the EU and other countries. So we have feed-in tariffs. I've said that before, to provide financial incentives for the uptake of renewables. We have the large combustion plant directive in the European <laughs> Union, which has, forced, which has forced a lot of the most highly polluting coal-fired power stations out of the market already. They've had to close in the UK and elsewhere. That is a top-down uh, command and control, if you will, approach to it. Um, so there are other ways to address the issues other than uh, emissions trading, which uh, doesn't provide the current, uh, currently provide the cost incentives or the price incentives to really shift to low-carbon futures. So, what choices do we need to make when it comes to the energy system, when it comes to the energy as underpinning uh, our economic system? So first, renewables across the system. The key here is what we've done in the last, that's the last slide I'll talk to, what we've done over the last uh, decades is to build out capacity in the power sector. We've built out uh, wind farms and solar farms and maybe some geothermal and some biomass, etc. But actually, people haven't really thought about the ecosystem that needs to exist around that. The systemic implications of going low carbon, 85, 90, 95 percent below 1990 baselines or 2005 baselines, because that means going beyond the power sector. It means going into transportation which is almost entirely oil-based. It means going into heating, which is entirely run on gas, almost entirely run on gas. And those things we haven't tackled at all yet. It means investing much more in storage. It means investing into uh, a grid that can deal with that, where we have interconnection between European countries to balance a supply and demand. So renewables across the system Perhaps a little bit easier said than done. We're good in the power sector, but we haven't done the other things yet. You want electromobility, you're going to have to build that out a lot more. Energy efficiency and savings, of course. Demand side, not just supply. That's where we produce the electricity from renewables, but demand side measures. And I said before that those are political choices. Where you put money in is a political choice. What you choose to support is a political choice. Whether or not you support you choose to continue in arrangements that are very cozy between an industry that is to be regulated, the policymaker and the regulatory agency, is a political choice and can change when pol political change comes, when elections bring in new governments. It can change through pressure too. Yeah? But if those political choices are the ones that matter, and if we think that perhaps we target is not achievable as it currently stands it isn't and what are we willing to do beyond renewables have grown in a way that those skeptics and others never expected economists never expected we read reports from a few years ago the IEA and other leading international organizations consistently 
growth of renewables consistently underestimate what they are able to do with the capacity growth that we've seen. Even with those underestimates and the real development, they're not going to be fast enough for us to you know, not miss the two degree target. We need to do something really, really fast. So, apart from shutting down all coal fired and gas fired power generation and banning all cars and trucks from the street, neither one of which I would suggest is going to happen, what other solutions and options do we have? And so, while personally, I believe that these things are achievable and doable, there are, of course, other solutions. There are other potential things that perhaps need to be done. I think it's important for environmentalists to be asking themselves if, on the basis of principle, and this is an important principle right here, and I understand, well understand that, they're opposed to this if it means, either one of those two, if it means overshooting the two degrees and moving into a three and a half degree world. And the consequences of that. If the money is available, and it is available in the private sector, surely, but government support coming to it, that is the overriding goal of achieving this two degree world and staying within the limits that the Paris Agreement have set is that stronger than the economic argument we might be able to make against those because they're very expensive indeed? Are the strategic or the survivalist instincts stronger and more important than losing money on these installations? I think that's an important question we need to ask. Right, I'll leave it at that and uh, happy to uh, field some questions. Thank you very much. You could argue that perhaps a well-designed emissions trading scheme could give us uh, emissions reductions. Um, of course, that design would require a low cap and a cap that gets reduced significantly year on year or uh, period on period, where we don't have an oversupply of, of emissions allowances, etc. Now, more generally speaking, there has been for many years a commitment to emissions trading as a tool, as a major tool to achieve emissions reductions internationally and domestically. So the Kyoto Protocol already spells it out as a flexibility mechanism. Of course, it's introduced on behest of the United States and lobby groups that very much push for this in the interest of industry, in the interest of businesses that want flexibility in the way they approach, approach emissions reductions. Um, the Paris Agreement reaffirms it. Of course, uh, the European Union takes it up on the backs of Kyoto as one of its main vehicles to try and achieve emissions reductions. But the, uh, the, the, the result of the European emissions trading scheme to date is not encouraging. Uh, the cost of emissions allowance, the price of an emissions allowance is around five euros or so, which is way too low to achieve any meaningful uh, change in uh, the economy and energy generation. 
and a shift away from low carbon sources. The reasons for why it is so low is there's an oversupply of allowances in the system. Um, it is uh, not necessarily terribly uh, designed. The political execution of it is very bad indeed though. So I think in theory, there are reasons to believe uh, why emissions trading could potentially be successful, but in practice it isn't and hasn't proven itself to be successful at all. So um, a number of different organizations will put out reports and have put out reports in the past, including the OECD and others, that have compared the effectiveness of different policy tools in reducing emissions. And they look at the European example and they take a snapshot and they look at emissions trading, look at feed-in tariffs, they look at various different other policy levers. And they come to the conclusion that, oh yes, emissions trading is the most cost-effective. Why? Because we've seen emissions reductions and the price of an emissions allowance is very low, so it's very cheap, and we've seen emissions reductions, haven't we? But actually, pretty much everyone in the field knows, when you really look at the, at the evidence, that those emissions reductions haven't really been achieved because of emissions trading. They've been achieved because of things like the large combustion plant directive. And here's your uh, comparison between trading and tax. In the UK, uh, we've seen a dramatic reduction in the use of coal over the last few years. And this is because of the, primarily because of the carbon price floor that the UK introduced. So the UK is part of the emissions trading scheme, but the only country in the European Union that actually introduced a floor under which the cost of an emissions allowance should not fall. It's fixed right now at 18 pounds out until 2020. Whereas the emissions allowances in the wider European emissions trading scheme are just five euros. So it makes coal as the most emissions intensive fossil fuel much more expensive than it does in other parts of the European Union under the emissions trading scheme. And the uh, the uh, 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 floor price is a tax because it's fixed by, it's a carbon tax, it's fixed by the government, it's set and decided by the government on the basis of a number of calculations, but it is not determined by those trading within the scheme uh, because that's the five euros, right? So uh, I would say that uh, based on that experience, you can very well argue that a tax is much more effective in practice the way it is being handled at the moment than trading schemes are, because certainly a trading scheme that involves so many different countries involves their political interests, their interests in wanting to shield their domestic industries. The Germans want to get exceptions for the automobile industry and uh, some of their large emissions intensive industries. They exempt them already from the renewable surcharge under the German feed and tariff system, so they get exemptions under the emissions trading system too, and so are other countries uh, uh, who are uh, pursuing very similar games to, to protect some uh, critical industries. Um, so in, in the UK case we see this and, and the reduction has led of course to significant emissions reductions, much more than expected. And if this trend continues, the UK will not just meet but overachieve its emissions reductions under the Paris Agreement easily, because it will push much, much more coal out of the mix and transition to, to more gas. Yeah. The question is, of course, what happens after 2020? If the Conservatives stay in power, will they keep uh, the tax? Will they increase it? Uh, will they reduce it? There are a number of uncertainties. We don't know. If this continues and they increase it, there's more ambition which the UK has committed itself to through its NDC, we might see that. So based on this experience, I would say that taxation is, is, is the better experience at this point in time. And I would also say that emissions trading, despite the debate around it, which makes it out to be this big thing, actually coexists with a number of other policy levers that can have significantly more impact in transitioning us towards a low carbon, low carbon future.
Um, so I can ask a follow-up. Um, um, cash profits out of uh, exploring in these areas in the commons, or what would you? Okay. In, in the commons, water in the yeah. commons, for example. Uh, yes. Right. So uh, let me start with uh, reducing consumption and uh, degrowth theory. So first of all, I would say that I'm more inclined, personally, I'd be more inclined to follow an argument that says that uh, there are a lot more efficiency savings, energy savings, and efficiency savings than we're currently than we're currently seeing. Uh, we can use energy more smartly, uh, and we have technologies and continue to develop technologies to enable us to do so, and smart grids, for example, so demand response measures, etc., are part of this. Now, that's the one side. From what I uh, would take from your question or your, the point you were raising is that perhaps um, you'd like to take this a bit further, that, uh, that you'd uh, like to see something more than just, uh, than just tink tinkering around the edges, you know, doing a little bit here or there on efficiency savings, energy savings. Growth theory. I have problems with that approach um, because I don't think, first of all, that is workable. I don't think there is a political appetite for it, even though I, I realize what the argument is. Kevin Anderson and others are, are, are making that argument. Um, something that I find interesting is that uh, the argument of degrowth theorists, and I it could be that uh, uh, there are newer iterations now that I'm not aware of, but as far as I understood it, is that while we're pursuing degrowth and we're looking at specific sectors in the industry as well, in the economy, that are particularly emissions intensive or that consume a lot of resources and energy intensive that need to be addressed because of the, they're the main culprits in many ways, are of course also sectors that are critically needed if we are to at the same time, which Kevin Anderson and others are saying, but if we are at the same time to expand renewable energies dramatically, those are industries such as concrete and steel, some of the most energy and emissions intensive industries we have in the world today. If we want to expand our use of renewables, not just in, on a smaller scale, but for large installations too, offshore wind farms, onshore, large solar farms, etc., geothermal power plants, we're going to need a lot more materials. We're going to need a lot more resources, a lot more concrete, a lot more steel. These industries will have to supply it. But the question for me is, how are you going to achieve that if you want to degrow and at the same time build out an infrastructure that we desperately need? So from that angle, I have my problems with the argument. At the same time, however, I do realize and understand that overconsumption of resources through dramatic growth and prosperity, wanting more and more, and of course, consumption patterns change, not just as the, the population grows, but as you shift from maybe the poor into the middle classes, etc., has gotten us into this fix that we're in in the first place. Um, I don't want to go as far as what you might want to call the Schwarzenegger school of tackling climate change, which is you can continue driving your big truck and uh, Hummer or whatever, as long as you fuel it with environmentally friendly fuel, as long as you are low carbon. Right? That's an argument that a lot of people are making. So the argument here would be, and that kind of goes into, into the, the third question as well, that economic growth and continue um, the way that it has up until now. We're just required to shift the basis upon which that growth and that economic development occurs. And if I can take the third question, I would say that 
I don't see efficient shifts away from some of these paradigms. Now, there are some shifts. For example, the, the older economic paradigm or the approach to having economies of scale is that we have very large installations, concentrated power, economic power, which then translates in many cases also into political power. So you have large power plants owned by a small number of utilities or, or companies, uh, and they have a captive market ideally. I don't necessarily see that in many quarters this, is, this understanding is changing, because what we're getting is large offshore wind farms, we're getting large solar parks, we're getting large installations that are controlled by large companies. So one large company will be replaced by another large company, basically milking you for your money in the future. So the argument that has been, that has been made is that once we've transitioned, to renewables, once the feed-in tariffs can run out, uh, we'll see massive price declines because uh, there is no cost to the wind as it blows and the sun as it shines. The cost that we incur if we continue to run coal and gas-fired power generation, so we don't have to buy in this stuff, so it should be cheaper, shouldn't it? I don't buy it. I would think that utility companies in the future, if they stay in the mix, if they stay important players, will continue to ramp up prices, whatever argument uh, they, can, they can find uh, to do so. Yeah. So that isn't changing. At the same time, though, there are some shifts that I'm sure you're very aware of uh, in terms of distribution and decentralization, independent power providers, smaller providers coming into the market, the liberalization packages in the European Union and individual approaches within European countries have tried to open up the market. It's not always been successful because countries have uh, continue to support national champions, large companies, large, uh, uh, large utility companies, uh, in many cases, um, and have shielded them from unbundling measures and from third-party access and, and, and all of that. But you see a number of co-ops taking back control. We've had that, I think, was it Hamburg or Berlin, one of the two places that certainly achieved it. And a number of smaller providers that, uh, that are pushing in. So the the challenge is to try and transition that further. Um, industry would make the argument that it's all good and well to have a lot of decentralized and localized generation, but for a lot of our activities, we need a lot of energy produced in one big place, effectively, rather than relying on a lot of small sources that from an energy security perspective, that isn't a good idea. Hence, we need those large installations. I think the future is more likely going to be a hybrid system where you have independent producers at home that are well, used to be just consumers. They would just take from the utility company, but now they're also producers and they send something back. That's the very idea behind feed and tariffs and enabling the production on a very small scale and opening that up. Um, but uh, the way things are, I do not see a, um, a shift that is dramatic enough move us away from, from, the, from a more you know, neoliberal paradigm that would say, focus your attention on some of the large players, deregulate as much as possible, um, um, create avenues for access into, into markets for them, um, uh, lower taxes, provide a good environment for them to thrive, um, which is, of course, not particularly beneficial for smaller players that need a leg up that needs support. Now, um, on the second question, on potential profits made off of the privatization of the commons, water, uh, whatever you might uh, be talking about, I think that, uh, well, it's not something that in international negotiations has had much of a, an airing yet, I would think, which is important to, to have that, though. I think at the end of the day, it will come back to, and I would be keen to hear your thoughts on it as well, it will come back to political decisions and political will on whether or not you want to see this going forward. I would actually be quite keen to hear what your thoughts are on this issue and where you think we're standing at the moment with these moves. Yes, please. Um, I, 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 I
I'd be aware, um, in terms of international financial order, taking up the issue of climate risk and climate-related financial disclosure, the Bank of England, the Financial Stability Board, in terms of having international institutions to address it, are addressing this issue more now. That doesn't mean that it will result in policies and uh, legislation and regulation that will enforce this in individual countries or member states of the G20, that companies have to uh, disclose the risks uh, of their, their investment portfolio activities. It's a first step in that direction. The incentivization that I see that uh, the main incentivization is the incentivization financially of uh, a shift. I don't see the incentivization yet that, that you speak about that might be necessary uh, for, the, for the global commons. I think this is the, the, the only realistic way right now for these things to be incentivized, perhaps not so much that. Um, Perhaps that's a bit sad to say that, but in terms of the insurance industry, the insurance industry is interesting. But when talking about climate risk and making sure that the impacts of climate change and the human suffering associated with that, and not just human suffering, but suffering of the natural world as well, um, beyond humans, may only get pushed up the agenda further in the presence of major disruptions to uh, ecosystems, the global climate, so tipping points that might be reached. Now, that would be most unfortunate if this is what we would have to wait for. But the history, history of policy making shows that in many cases we only get more disruptive change as a consequence of a focusing event as a consequence of a major crisis, that much of policy making is incremental. We layer, we change things slightly to adjust the system as it is, rather than building a whole new system, we're adjusting the system as it is, but changing the basis upon which we operate economically, which can get us part of the way there. And I think it will get us part of the way there. The question is, will it get, will it get us all the way there? Which is not looking that likely at this point in time. So do we have to wait for a major disruption for more action to be forthcoming? That would be very sad if this is what would have to be the case, but it is a question worth worth asking. You had a... Yeah, okay, sorry. I'm going to take this right now before we go into the others because we of course have historical precedent of large oil and gas companies trying to branch out a little bit. Shell did that for a while, more so than they do now. BP tried that when they tried to restyle themselves as beyond petroleum uh, under Lord Brown. Um, and they did away with it because they realized that it didn't serve their bottom line. They weren't a renewable energy company. They weren't a company in the business of energy efficiency or whatever else. They're a company that's in the business to bring oil out of the ground, uh, if necessary, to refine it and then to market it. So they returned to that bottom line. And for a while, it served them well. Right now, they're struggling a little bit because of the lower oil price, not because uh, the legislation would be so biting uh, and the international agreements would be so terrible for them. Now, ExxonMobil actually came out in support of Paris Agreement and Tillerson as well, and I uh, am sure 
while doing that, they would still have and still continue to channel some funds into, into efforts to undermine it at the same time. But publicly, at least, we'd say we support it, probably because of the voluntary nature of it and because they know that the United States isn't going to put so much forward. I don't see these companies necessarily branching out. They've tried it. They're not doing that at the moment. I do see a slight change uh, when it comes to shareholders. At the last, the last or one of the last big shareholder uh, gatherings for Exxon, I think it was 38% of the shareholders that voted for Exxon taking a clearer and stronger line on climate change and the uh, climate-related risks uh, that would accrue to a company such as Exxon continuing to operate in the space. Now, that's not a majority, and it's certainly very far from a supermajority, but it is a lot more than it used to be a few years ago. So there are shareholders who are getting a little bit nervous as to some of the arguments that are now in the system. I don't think that uh, they'll go without a fight. I think that much is clear. And I don't think why, from their perspective, they should. If I, I mean, I'm not making a moral argument that they, that they should fight it. I'm just looking at, at it from the perspective of Exxon or Shell or BP and what they do, what they think they do best, and what they make a profit by doing. Uh, they won't go without a fight, and they probably shouldn't from that perspective. Um, but the transition is going to have to be one where first coal goes out because of uh, the force we put in and the policies we put in, and if we are true to the commitments that we've made under Paris, then the first thing that has to go is coal. Gas will transition. Actually, uh, I should say that I found it very interesting that just a few years ago, uh, the game in the fossil fuel world changed uh, as I perceived it. It used to be the case that fossil fuel companies had a more or less united front against renewables and against alternatives and against the shift towards uh, low carbon futures and addressing climate change. When you talk to large gas companies, oil and gas companies now, they'll point the finger at the coal companies and say, these guys need to go. So they've realized that there's something stirring and they know that coal is the most emissions intensive fuel and that's sort of divided their lines a little bit. With the oil and gas companies, I think that transition is more likely going to move if we manage electromobility or if we manage hydrogen fuel cells or any of these alternatives that we need to shift transportation, they're going to focus more on gas than on, on oil. And the debate around gas is a tricky one too, as you know, because uh, while many people would like to see gas as a transition fuel to a low carbon future, the industry treats it more as a destination fuel. Says, okay, we're now putting in place the infrastructure we need. Gas, lower carbon, helps us to get there, but we can keep these plants for 40, 50 years. Of course, you don't want that if you need to achieve your 85, 90, 95% emissions reductions. That means gas also needs to come out, unless you did something like that. Carbon capture and storage, which of course they're also aggressively pushing, carbon capture and storage, as a way to extend your life <laughs> as a way to extend your, your half-life, if you will, in this, in this brave new world. I think at some point things will happen very quickly. I think at some point we'll, we'll move very quickly. But that point is not there yet across the world. Oh, uh, we I just have, have to say, I am conscious of time. I have time for one round of questions. We'll take three, then. Yeah, so... Um, if you think the uh, economy And services. Uh, there's a strong case to be made that the environment and resources are affected of our goods and services. Um, now, do you feel that um, our current economic framework is sufficient um, when it addresses economic growth? And if you bring the economic framework, uh, what's that saying? I'm not 
much as they are, or more. Economic implications of global regional networks. Let me do that first. Regional networks, yes, uh, styled on the basis of the European Union integration, interconnection, which isn't there yet. We need a lot more interconnection between a number of different European countries, Spain, France, for example. Uh, there's more interconnection between some of the other countries within the European system. That helps us balance this. It helps benefit the renewable sector. Um, globally, First of all, there are a few regions where it's going to be more difficult to produce electricity, where there are security challenges, economic challenges, political challenges, where it's not going to be as easy right now to be doing that, where there's conflict. Um, you have to have some kind of stability for that. Um, large infrastructure, critical infrastructure um, can be threatened in those situations. But more critically than that, um, having extremely long transmission lines and transmission grids between, you know, the far ends of the world um, isn't a particularly economically efficient way of doing things at this point in time, not just because of the infrastructure cost, but also the line loss, the line loss you would incur. There are, of course, now grids that allow you to transport over longer distances with significantly less line loss, and perhaps at some point that'll be something we can do. I think right now we need to be sufficiently big for an area or a region to be able to balance these things. And I think within a European context, with different renewables, with backup through storage, ideally, perhaps we'll need some uh, fossil fuel backup, but then you'd have to think about that. Um, that that's a good idea in a Northern American context as well, in an Asian, Southeast Asian context as well, and these debates about the ASEAN supergrid and all the so ASEAN power grid. Um, but uh, uh, regional integration, yes, absolutely critically important. Globally, there's some question marks uh, behind that uh, right now um, because the electricity transport. The only other thing you transport are the, the turbines or the solar panels. Uh, it's much easier today, from a transportation perspective, globally to transport a barrel of oil around the world or a lump of coal than it is to do some of these other things. Yeah? as the thing that actually contains the energy, rather than having to install uh, the turbines or the, uh, the solar panels first. Um, on degrowth, so I'll do it the other way, the other way around. Uh, no, I agree with you that uh, renewables and energy efficiency are probably not quite enough. I said as much that uh, the trajectory we're on, despite the growth rates we've seen, which have consistently been better than forecast and projected, we're probably still not going to get there in time. And it would take us longer than it should to, uh, to achieve these, uh, to achieve or to stay within the two degree target. Um, that's why I asked the question as to whether or not these should be, should be part of the equation. Uh, of course, I know that that doesn't address the degrowth argument. That continues with uh, the approach that we've been taking for the last decades in terms of the way we've built the system and the way the system is run from an economic development and growth perspective. But if you consult a number of uh, uh, companies, groups that look into energy developments, IHS and Platts and others, they'll all say this, they don't see any future where this isn't part of it because of the development path we're on. Um, I am sympathetic to the degrowth argument, but I think that from a political perspective, it is not achievable. And therefore, I am not willing to spend my time to accept it as a viable alternative. I'm, will I'm very willing to talk about it in theoretical terms, but I don't believe that we should spend our time pushing for this when there is absolutely nowhere any appetite 
for this to happen. I think we should focus our energies and our resources on trying to affect the changes that we can affect, um, which might have to include these. So we know, just to finish that point, I'll let you get back, of course. But to, to finish that point, uh, you know as well as I do and everybody else here that there's so many places around the world, and you've identified a few, that are building out infrastructure that is emissions intensive in order to address energy poverty, in order to be able to put people you know, into a position where they can consume electricity and energy in the first place. And that, in many cases, is coal-fired. So, we're not Germany. You said, you know, a number of countries have tried to transition. They still haven't gotten some of it out of the mix. Germany still relies on 40-odd percent for its power generation on coal, even though they've had this beautiful energy transition, investing in renewables, which is great. It's had so much progress. And yet, the share of coal remains stubbornly in the mix. So if we transition further, we can't do it without. Of course, this requires a lot of capital. This requires some larger scale efforts that I don't see happening in an environment where we discuss uh, a, a degrowth, but an environment where we continue to have growth and invest into this. This, I know, is critical for a lot of countries, both positively speaking and in a, in a bad way. So a lot more controversial. But, but those are the, the, options, the options I see um, in terms of developing country contexts, poverty, leapfrogging is going to be the only way to get around that. We do see that in a number of contexts. So not going down the dirty development path that the global north has gone down, that China has gone down, but leapfrogging that. But that requires finance, that requires technology transfer, that requires cooperation in the countries and the international system and companies too, so you'd have to force them to actually do it. Right? The CTCN that we currently have under UNEP, the Climate Change uh, uh, Technology Transfer Network, is a beautiful thing. It works with a lot of developing countries to develop certain projects, but it is very small. The amount of money that is actually behind it and the number of projects that are being financed are very small. The pilot projects, great. We now need to do everything we can to scale that up. But to do so, I would argue, and I know you disagree with me on that, is not to pursue degrowth, but to keep pushing growth. Or maybe I've misread your argument, and you can come back on it. Uh, uh, Rob, I'll, I'll have to, I'm running out of time, I have to talk to you about uh, uh, externalities in the current framework separately, because we had that question earlier. Um, let me give, give her a chance real quick to, to, to come back on that, please. I understood, I understood what you mean. Mm. Uh, absolutely. It's, it's worth thinking about in any case. I, I, I get you. What I'm, what I'm saying is you, you say, okay, Global North, we have to achieve some reductions. Global South that needs to develop, they should be able to, to grow more, whereas we have to have a reduction in, in the North. Um, or to go into a more fine-grained analysis to say within an economy there are certain sectors that are problematic, so we need to address those and not others. Now, think of the argument that you would make as a consequence of that. You're talking about, both in domestic context and internationally, a completely managed and structured economy. Whether or not that is the right way forward, we can debate whether or not anyone is actually going to accept that as the right way forward. That I have my doubts over because the Cold War, in the, the end of the Cold War, in the minds of many policymakers, decided that. It was decided that the managed and completely structured economy of the Soviet Union collapsed because it was super inefficient. It didn't manage to do anything at all. Now, you can say that's a misreading of what they tried to do and that they actually 
approach the theoretical debate in practice in a, in a way that wasn't right and, and effective. But that argument has been killed off as a consequence of that. Try and talk about nationalization in this country. The Labour Party won't do it. Not when they're in power anyways. Nationalizing, because that, that would be the next step. You nationalize certain services and you force through targets. Because that's what you're basically saying. You're imposing targets. You have to make sure that there's less being consumed or less being achieved. That's not, that's not going to happen uh, from my experience. As much as perhaps from a global perspective we might want it. Because what you're actually identifying is correct. You're identifying the right problems. But the solution I disagree with, um, not because I don't think it's worth discussing it, but because I think we're not going to get it in that way, unfortunately, uh, for the global, the global climate. Yeah? Um, I don't have any final <laughs> words. It's late, you know, people want to go. So I think... Uh, I think um, so uh, thank you very much, Harold, for this, uh, for this excellent talk. Let's give Harold a Thank you. Thank you.